really happy to have this series of talks about uh, Shimura varieties and abelian varieties and curves in positive characteristic. And today we're starting off this series with a talk by Bryden Case on Iwasawa theory for class group schemes and characteristic P. And Bryden, is it all right if we record this talk? Yes, yes, of course. Yeah. Wonderful. And if you have questions during the talk, feel free to uh, stop Bryden and, and ask. Okay, please go ahead. Yeah, very happy to have questions. Uh, yeah, thanks very much, Rachel, for the introduction. And uh, many thanks to Drew and Rachel for the invitation to speak. Uh, it's uh, quite an honor, and especially being the, the first talk. Um, yeah, so thank you. So, uh, right, I want to describe a uh, novel analog of Iwasawa theory um, for function fields. So to set that up, let me fix a finite field, uh, little k of characteristic p, your favorite prime. Uh, and I also want to fix a curve over k. And by curve, I'm always going to mean uh, smooth, projective, geometrically connected, one-dimensional variety. <laughs> so every time I say curve, that's what it's going to mean. Uh, and maybe crucially, I'm demanding geometrically connected. Uh, so that's sort of hidden in the background in some places. All right, so associated to such a thing is its class group, which I'll denote by CL sub X. Uh, and this is just the group of degree zero divisors on X defined over K uh, modulo the principal divisors. And okay, it's a finite abelian group, uh, much like the number field case. But there's kind of a miracle that happens for function fields, which is that uh, this finite abelian group is not just any old abelian group. It's actually the K rational points of uh, a very special algebraic variety, namely the Jacobian of X. So, you know, the, the, at a first pass of Iwasawa theory, would be to study how these class groups grow in say ZL towers of curves where L is some prime. Uh, maybe L is P, maybe L is not P, you know, just some other prime. Okay, uh, I guess I should say what I mean by a ZL tower. So for me, uh, for a prime L, a ZL tower over a given X is going to be a collection of curves in the above sense, where uh, Xn is a branched Galois cover of X0, and X0 is the same as this fixed X. So at the bottom you have X, and over it you have all these branched Galois covers, and uh, each, you know, the, the nth layer has Galois group Z mod P to the NZ, and this is compatible with change in N. I also want to demand that all of these covers are unramified outside some fixed set S of K rational points of X. Uh, this makes things a little simpler. And I also want to demand that every point in S is totally ramified uh, at every layer of this, of this tower. That also makes things a bit simpler. Uh, okay. So it's kind of a pleasant exercise using class field theory uh, to prove that if L is different from P or if S is empty, there are no such towers. Uh, they, just, they just don't exist over, over little k, my finite field. So that means that the one case of interest is when L and P are the same, and we're looking at ZP towers uh, of curves and characteristic P, and uh, S, this branch locus, is non-empty. So what can you say about such things? Well, just by Galois theory, there's you know, this dictionary where any such tower can be kind of bundled together as a representation of the etal fundamental group uh, of X with this branch locus deleted. And strictly speaking, I should go up to K bar because uh, I really want kind of geometric covers, right? I don't, 
I don't want uh, Xn to just be some number of copies of X0. I want it to be geometrically connected. Okay, um, so right, uh, a tower is the same as a continuous representation of this etal fundamental group uh, surjecting onto Zp. The thing is that since S is non-empty, this X minus S is gonna be affine. And uh, one knows, I think this goes back to Shafarevich, that the maximal pro P quotient through which any surjective row onto ZP would factor, uh, that quotient of the tall fundamental group of an affine curve over an algebraically closed field of characteristic P, that's a free pro P group on countably infinitely many generators. So it's this kind of gargantuanly massive thing. Uh, this is in stark contrast to what happens in the case of number fields. And uh, in particular, such a free pro P group is gonna have gazillions of continuous ZP quotients. So uh, whereas in the case L not P, you sort of can't find any towers. When L is P, there's more than you could really ever want. So there's just tons and tons and tons of them. Okay, um, so that's good. We have lots of things to think about. All right, so in fact, uh, this idea of studying class groups in ZP towers was of course thought of because it's such a natural idea. And it was studied, I think first by uh, Gold Kisilevsky uh, in 1984 and at about the same time, uh, Mazur Wiles. Uh, and I think their paper is from 1986. And they proved the following rather beautiful analog of Iwasawa's theorem for class group of number fields. And it says, you give me any ZP tower in the above sense, uh, then you can give a very precise formula for the cardinality of the P torsion in the class group of the nth layer. And it's P to the mu P to the N plus nu for some integers mu and nu uh, and all N sufficiently large. So that's what they proved. Um, they have an, there's an analogous result if you want not just the P torsion, but the P primary torsion, uh, which might look a bit more familiar to uh, kind of those familiar with classical Iwasawa theory. But I just wanna focus on the P torsion because I think it's already extremely interesting uh, and it's in some ways simpler. All right, so, um, that's great. This was done, you know, like not long after I was born. That's a long time ago. <laughs> what else is there to do? Well, um, the story I want to tell really starts with this kind of innocuous looking observation that I put in yellow, which is that the P torsion in the class group of Xn, well, uh, we know these class groups are uh, rational points of algebraic groups, taking P torsion, well, we just take the P torsion in the Jacobian and take its K points. That's the K points of this gadget, uh, JXN brackets P, which is a finite group scheme. It's the kernel of multiplication by P on this algebraic group, uh, this Jacobian. So it's much, much more than just a finite group. It's a finite group scheme. Uh, if you like, it's it's a functor uh, from schemes to groups. And any such functor can be decomposed in the following way into an etal piece and a connected piece. And the connected piece really is connected sort of topologically. Uh, and when you take rational points, which is what you know the above does in yellow, all you see is the etal part. Uh, the connected group scheme G0, when you evaluate, when you look at its K points, it's just the trivial group. So if you want to know anything about G0, K points isn't gonna cut it, right? And it sort of totally misses it. Uh, and as, a, as an example of this in the context of ZP towers, you could take a really simple example where your base curve is the projective line, you want to think about ZP towers ramified over infinity. 
And in that case, the P torsion in the class group in this traditional sense, taking K points of, of Jacobians, is just a trivial group for, for all N. But on the other hand, these P torsion group schemes, uh, which I kind of want to call the class, the P torsion in the class group scheme, these things have dimension GN, which is the genus of XN. And uh, one can show ultimately because all ramification here is wild that the genus grows like some positive constant times P to the two N or at least that fast. That's a lower bound. Um, and it turns out as, as I'll say later that these GNs, even in such simple examples they can grow arbitrarily fast. Like pick your favorite sequence of integers whatever it may be you can find a ZP tower over P1 branched only at infinity where the genus sequence grows faster than whatever you thought of. Um, that's kind of terrifying, uh, but okay, that's life. And so this refined Iwasawa theory that I wanna talk about is to ask not just how do these class groups grow because that was done a long time ago, but how do these class group schemes grow? Right? What, what happens uh, with JXN brackets P as you go up a ZP tower of curves? And there's really just not any analog uh, of this for number fields, right? This is an extremely characteristic P kind of question to ask. Okay, so what, what can I tell you about this? Well, if you wanna say anything about group schemes, in characteristic P, you kind of want some Dudenay theory because that's the basic tool for studying these gadgets. Uh, and what does it do? It gives you an equivalence of categories between finite group schemes over your finite field K that are killed by P and uh, Dudenay modules. So those are finite dimensional vector spaces over K equipped with additive maps F and V they're semi-linear uh, in, in the below sense uh, and they commute and their product in either order is zero. Uh, and blackboard bold D is this functor. It's a contravariant exact functor. So uh, that's great to have an equivalence of categories but even better is to have some kind of explicit description uh, of what this blackboard bold D actually is. And that such a description was provided by Oda in his thesis. Um, and the theorem is that if you give me any curve, well, on the one hand, you have an exact sequence of group schemes. Uh, this looks a little unwieldy with these superscripts of P, but basically you have the P torsion in the Jacobian that maps to the F torsion in the Jacobian, where F is Frobenius, and the kernel is the V torsion in the Jacobian, where V is either the Verschiebung map uh, on, on the Jacobian, which is a thing that you can read about in some SGA somewhere, uh, or you can just take V to be the dual of F with respect to the canonical autoduality of Jacobians. Uh, and that's a perfectly good definition of V as well. So you have some exact sequence of group schemes like that. The upper P's, well, those are just kind of Frobenius twists to get everything to be uh, correct. Some minor technical point. Oda's theorem says that when you apply this contravariant Dudenay module functor to it, you get the Durham cohomology of the curve. Uh, well, you get its Hodge filtration exact sequence. And this, this is a description really as Dudenay modules with F and V. So F here is Frobenius coming from uh, the P power map ultimately on your curve in characteristic P. And V is the Cartier operator, which has some nice intrinsic description, but you could just think about it as the dual of Frobenius uh, under the usual duality cup product pairing on Durand cohomology. So using the student A theory and this kind of nice description, the, uh, the upshot is that if you have a curve X, 
the K brackets V module structure of the global differentials, well, it determines the F torsion group scheme in the Jacobian. And by duality, it's also gonna determine the V torsion group scheme. And the P torsion, which is what, you know, we kind of care about and what I wanna understand, that's an extension of the F torsion by the V torsion. And so you can argue that, well, you know, up to a single extension, just understanding differentials with the action of the Cartier operator will tell you what the P torsion looks like. That downplays extensions a little bit. Uh, in this business, extensions are king. Uh, <laughs> they can be um, pretty strange uh, and yeah, really quite, quite wild. So I don't wanna downplay them too much, but uh, I also think it's fair to say that if you know the F torsion and the V torsion, you know at least half of the P torsion. So uh, that's what I'll go with. And now this is a sort of explicit question that you could imagine uh, programming into a computer, more on that later. How does the K brackets V module, I'll call it M sub N, global differentials on the nth layer of your ZP tower, uh, how does that grow? Well, uh, we know some things about this. So let's, let's write down what we know already. First of all, the dimension of this K vector space is the genus of XN. And there's a Riemann Hurwitz formula for that, uh, which I've written down in terms of the genus of X zero and the uh, upper ramification breaks at all of the branch points. And, <clears throat> You know, in characteristic zero, of course, this formula is much simpler because there's no wild ramification, but in characteristic P, you really need uh, a much more unwieldy formula uh, with all the ramification breaks because everything is wild. Okay, so that's the remark, uh, right? You've got Z mod P to the NZ covers in characteristic P, uh, so ramification will necessarily be wild. And uh, these upper breaks, it's known that their successive ratios are bounded below by P, but they can be unbounded. Um, and as I think I mentioned before, this implies that the genus grows at least as fast as some constant times P to the two N, and it can grow as fast as you please. So uh, I wanna rule out um, things that are just kind of too crazy, uh, and there's a lot of them. So as a, as a first pass, I want to think about ZP towers that have what I'll call stable monodromy. So that means that these upper breaks are given by some nice formula uh, that's uniform in N. Here, DQ and CQ are some constants. This will be for all Q and all N at least, at least some bound, all N sufficiently large. So DQ and CQ might depend on Q. So that's the definition. Um, it's, it's pretty common to find uh, ZP towers like this in nature. So for example, uh, the Igusa tower, which is a tower of uh, Shimura curves in characteristic P, it satisfies this condition. Um, and it's kind of the primeval example coming, coming from nature, about which I don't think I'm gonna say anything. Uh, other than that. Okay, um, what more can we say? Well, uh, Fitting's lemma tells you that your space MN of differentials is a direct sum of a maximal submodule MN bijective on which V is bijective uh, and a maximal submodule MN nil on which V is nil potent. The bijective part is uh, somehow very well understood. And I have an annoying conflict of notation here. I guess I used SN. Maybe I should just, I guess I shouldn't change it because the notes were already sent. But uh, yeah, here the SN is just some integer. It has nothing to do with the ramification breaks that, that occur above. So sorry for the small conflict in notation. Uh, Anyway, this, this bijective piece, at least over K bar, it's just some number of copies of uh, K bar brackets V mod V minus one. Uh, and there's a formula 
for the number of copies. So this is the Doring Shafarevich formula. Uh, and there it is. It's a very nice analog of the Riemann Hurwitz formula. So, so far it feels like things are going well. We have a formula for the dimension of MN, a formula for er, the structure <laughs> and the dimension of MN bijective. How about MN nilpotent? Well, um, you know, you have a vector space and a linear operator, well, semi-linear operator uh, that's nilpotent. And it's not so hard to see that uh, these integers that I'll call higher A numbers, just the kernel of the rth iterate of V on MN, its dimension, right? That's this A N R. Uh, that sequence for R equals one, two, three, four, et cetera, uh, those are integers that will completely determine the uh, K brackets V module structure of MN nil. Okay, so everything's encoded in integers now. And uh, what you'd like is some kind of analog of the Riemann Hurwitz formula or the Dorian Shafarevich formula for these higher A numbers. <clears throat> but unfortunately, there is no such formula. Um, these are actually very mysterious numbers. And here's a kind of prototypical example uh, that illustrates their fundamental mystery. So when P is 13, you can think about Z mod PZ covers of the projective line branched only at infinity whose unique ramification break is seven, right? So that means that the ramification groups are Z mod PZ, Z mod PZ, Z mod PZ, seven times, or maybe it's eight times. I always get my numbering sort of mixed up and then zero, zero, zero thereafter. Uh, and these things are very explicit thanks to Art and Schreier theory. They're given by Y to the P minus Y is some F, where F is going to be a rational function on P1. And if I only want uh, ramification over infinity, then that rational function should look like a Laurent tail in T. <clears throat> so uh, here are some examples. Um, and you'll notice that they all start off T to the minus seven. So that's capturing the fact that I want unique ramification break seven. And here are some A numbers, uh, A superscript one. So the dimension of the kernel of V acting on the holomorphic differentials. And it's, you know, as you see, 21, 23, 24, 27, 36. On the other hand, by Riemann Hurwitz, the genus of all of these covers is always 36 because they have the same ramification break, seven. And by the Doring Shafarevich formula, uh, this thing I called S1 earlier is always zero. So you can see that these, these A numbers, even for like just a single layer of a tower, right? The very first layer, they can be all over the place. Um, and so that kind of dashes any hope of there being a formula for them that depends solely on, you know, like ramification invariance. The other thing to say is, okay, this is a Z mod PZ cover, but in general, an entire, <clears throat> sorry, an entire ZP tower can be made very explicit by Art and Trier VIT theory. And the description is, well, you can literally write down the function field of, of the nth layer of some tower, and it's just your finite field adjoin y1 through yn. And uh, there's some equation which happens in vit vector land. Uh, and there it is. Uh, and yeah. Okay. This subtraction, that's happening in, in vit vector arithmetic. And so there's these like VIT polynomials that give addition and subtraction and things like that. They get astonishingly complicated very, very fast. So if you actually try and do this on a computer, like in Magma and say, ooh, I want you to compute this difference of VIT vectors and give me some like honest to goodness equations. Uh, by the time you get to the third layer, even when P is really small, like two or three, 
uh, or the fourth layer, or God forbid, the fifth layer. I mean, these these equations just take up screens and screens of data. They're they're awful <laughs> uh, and totally unwieldy, even for small p and small n. So even though it looks very pretty uh, computationally, it's 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 hard. Okay. Um, so, right. So one thing to say in this explicit description is that if your VIT vector on the right side has component zero after some point, uh, then the corresponding tower is going to have stable monodromy in the previous sense. So it's a kind of finiteness condition in this Art and Schreier VIT description. All right. So, um, a couple of years ago, Jeremy Boer and I uh, decided that we wanted to do computations. And uh, we didn't exactly do the thing that I just described. We sort of did that, but <clears throat> we used um, we used these VIT vector packages of Luis Fanati to kind of massively speed up the VIT vector stuff. Uh, and then we made a whole bunch of other tweaks um, to actually compute what these higher A numbers are for some simple towers. And our computations showed totally astonishing regularity, like Iwasawa theory style regularity for these rather mysterious invariants. And so I've written down a conjecture that we made uh, in the case of towers with stable monodromy. There it is. It says the, uh, the rth higher A number at level N should be given by some constant r divided by r plus p e plus one over p minus one times something depending only on the ramification, this sum of dqs times p to the two n plus some error. Uh, and the error is sort of much smaller relative to the main term. Um, these computations were challenging. <laughs> because right, the genus grows like p to the two n. So even for p is three, if you want to compute five layers in some tower, well, eventually you're going to be computing kernels of matrices that are like, you know, three to the tenth by three to the tenth, or some constant times some constant times three to the tenth, you know, that that size. That's really big. Those matrices have lots and lots of entries. Uh, and in practice, you know, we found even for small primes like you know, three, five, seven, and going n up to four or five, these matrices would take gigabytes to store. Uh, and then, you know, we used magma, which is very, very good at linear algebra, but computing kernels of their powers, right? I mean, it, yeah, I mean, it sort of melted my computer for a month. Uh, but eventually it spat out some, spat out some integers and they were amazingly regular. Uh, so yeah, we were very surprised by this. Um, hey, hey, Brian, can I ask a, a question about this? Yeah, yeah of course. Um, uh, this stable monodromy condition, do you feel like that's a generic condition on these, on these towers? That is a really good question. Um, Yeah, and I don't, I don't know. Um, so I think, I think there's some, there's some notion of like towers coming from geometry that I think is due to Da Cheng Wan. Uh, and I think he has a version of towers coming from geometry that are more over ordinary. Uh, and in, in that sense of ordinary, I think all of those towers satisfy this stable monodromy or something close to it. But I don't, I don't know if those conditions are generic in, in like an actual moduli theoretic way. Um, so yeah, I don't know. It's a really good question. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, actually, I don't, I don't even know how to, how to construct like a moduli space of Art and Schreier covers of something other than P1. I mean, I think I've seen the moduli space of Art and Triac covers of the projective line, but what if you take something of positive genus, like is, is it sort of easy to describe this moduli stack and like compute facts about it? I, yeah, I don't know. 
Um, I, I think those are really interesting questions. Uh, okay. Um, so, uh, Right, that's a conjecture. Um, and together with uh, Joe Kramer Miller uh, and James Upton, we were able to prove some instances of this conjecture. So to describe those instances, I'll define what, what we call basic towers. So those are just ones that have a pretty specific Art and Schreier VIT description namely the VIT vector that you're choosing is like some sum of Teichmuller lifts. Uh, and okay, there's some conditions where like AD is not zero and A sub I is supposed to be zero whenever I divides P. Uh, these are all monodromy stable. They're covers of the projective line branched only over infinity. And uh, the theorem is that the conjecture is true. So, uh, that conjecture uh, is true for this class of towers. And actually, Jeremy and I conjectured something a bit stronger for this class of towers, again, based on numerical evidence, which is uh, a formula where the error term is not p to the n, it's actually some multiple of n. So it's linear in n plus <clears throat> kind of a constant term. And the constant term is periodic. Uh, and actually, we can even predict what the period is. Uh, and the period's generally kind of small. Um, so there's some like very, very precise formula for these things. But it only kicks in for n sufficiently large. And in computations, n sufficiently large means like three. <laughs> uh, but I, I, I'm convinced you could write down examples where, where sufficiently large really has to be taken like arbitrarily like very, very large. Uh, it's just the kinds of examples that we could really get our hands on were generally fairly simple. Okay. Um, so yeah, I guess, I guess I wanna describe what goes into the proof of this theorem since um, I think it has some kind of interesting connections with other things. So um, to do that, let me fix, let me fix one of these basic towers and I'll write pi for the uh, covering map from level N down to level M uh, where M is less than N. I guess I should have uh, subscripts of N and M on pi, but that just makes life way too complicated. Uh, so I'll abuse notation a little bit. I hope that's okay. Let me write dn for the nth upper ramification break at infinity. Uh, and for divisor on my curve xn, I want to write mn of d as the space of differential forms on xn that have poles no worse than d. Uh, so when d is effective, you're, you're allowing some poles. And I'll write mn for mn of zero. That kind of jives with, with what we had before. All right. Um, so then I want to form this thing uh, that I'll just call m. And uh, this is the projective limit of these spaces mn. And I want to use the trace maps associated to these covering maps pi. So Pi gives you two maps. It gives you pullback of differential forms in one direction, and it also gives you trace of differential forms in the other. Uh, and I want to make my projected limits with trace. Um, okay, this thing is a lambda module where, uh, okay, really is the Iwasawa algebra in this context, uh, but I'll think of it as just power series in T. And T, I'm going to identify with the element gamma minus one, where gamma generates the Gawa group of, uh, of this tower. So uh, this is the usual thing you do in Iwasawa theory, but uh, there are some, there's some magic in characteristic P. So I've written down 
three magical things that appear all over the place in uh, proofs. The first magical thing is if you take T and raise it to the P to the M, well, by definition, that's, you know, in this kind of completed group algebra, it's gamma minus one to the P to the M. But the group algebra, the group algebra is in characteristic P. So that's gamma to the P to the M minus one and uh, gamma to the P to the M generates the Galois group over KM. So there's this kind of thing that happens that you know everybody knows in characteristic P uh, that's actually very, very useful and occurs everywhere. The second thing that happens is, well, what if you trace a differential and then pull it back? There's some usual formula for this, that it's the sum of Galois conjugates. So I wrote down, you know, sum of Galois conjugates. But, you know, that's a geometric series whose sum is, as I've written it, the magic of characteristic P kicks in and actually uh, trace followed by pullback is just multiplication by some power of T. Uh, that's also quite special. The third thing that happens is if you do it in the other order, pull back then trace, well, that's multiplication by the degree of your map, which is some power of P, which is zero on anything in characteristic P. So these three things, although they're kind of simple, uh, they're very, very characteristic P specific, and they just show up all over the place in proofs. So um, here's a kind of bird's eye view of what happens in the proof. Step one is to prove that this projective limit of holomorphic differential forms up your tower is actually just a countable product of copies of lambda. Uh, this is kind of weird because uh, you can show that the holomorphic differentials at each level have boatloads of uh, T power torsion in them, right? So there'll be there'll be K brackets T mod T to the P to the N modules, and they actually have uh, a factor, like um, they actually have a factor of K brackets T mod T to the I for every I. <laughs> All of the possible uh, Artinian quotients occur. Uh, at each level, and the multiplicities, you know, increase very quickly. But somehow, in the limit where all gets patched together, everything is free, right? There's sort of no t torsion. And what that means is that you can make the tensor product uh, of this projective limit with. Q, where, where Q is the fraction field of lambda, so Laurent series in T, you can make that into a Banach space uh, over, this, uh, over this quotient by just declaring M to be the unit ball. This is a very weird thing to do, right? I mean, people study Iwasawa algebras and modules over them all the time. Uh, and like T is reporting some like a group action yeah, but then like inverting T to get some sort of Banach module, that's really weird. I, I've not seen this before um, and it's a very strange thing, but that's, that's what we do. Uh, so step two on this projective limit, you've got this Cartier operator, this, this V map. And step two is to prove that this is completely continuous or nuclear. Uh, and like in the in the Banaki sense. And uh, so what, I mean, okay, what does that mean? Concretely, that means that if you look at uh, the image of V mod T to the J for any J, that image will be finite uh, depending on J. So that's, that's what completely continuous means in this context. And the reason we like completely continuous operators is because we can take their Fredholm determinants. Uh, so there's some kind of uh, L series, if you like, which is the determinant of one minus 
S times V acting on this, this sort of unit ball in a Banach space, that's going to be a power series in S with coefficients in this Iwasawa algebra. So this, this thing is defined. Um, and crucially, you have to use monodromy stability for this. Um, it, it really is an essential hypothesis. Um, well, it can be relaxed a little bit, uh, but you know, only a little bit. Okay, the third ingredient is to relate this Fredholm determinant to like an actual honest to goodness L series. And uh, well, how does that go? Um, this tower XN, it's the same as giving me a representation of the Atal fundamental group valued in uh, the group ZP, which I'll suggestively write as gamma. And gamma lives inside of the units of lambda uh, by sending a generator to one plus T. And so now I have a row from the Atal fundamental group of the affine line to uh, lambda. <laughs> uh, and that row, right? So I, I think of row as valued in lambda that records the tower. And then I can make its art and L series, right? Where you sort of take a product over all closed points in the affine line of one divided by one minus rho of Frobenius, right? Rho is unramified at, at V in the affine line, uh, S to the degree of V. So I can take this product. And there's this really nice um, interpretation of L functions, art and L functions, uh, is a crystalline interpretation where you can realize this formula as uh, some kind of trace formula in crystalline cohomology. And what that tells you if you stare at it long and hard enough is that this L of S that I wrote down above is the same as this L of rho S, this Arden L function. But those two are really equal as uh, this power series in S. Okay, so that's kind of step three. Step four is um, some stuff with Hodge and Newton polygons. So M has this V acting on it, and uh, it's going to have a Hodge polygon, which, which encodes the Smith normal form of V. And that's what we ultimately want to know about, because the Smith normal form of V is going to tell you, uh, it's going to tell you like, the lambda module structure of like the co-kernel of V and, and you know, uh, maybe you can parlay that into information about the co-kernel of powers of V. Um, and if you sort of know that, then uh, it's not so hard to get back to uh, these actual higher A numbers, right? So somehow those are all written in uh, the Smith normal form of V and its powers. And that's encoded by this Hodge polygon. On the other hand, there's a Newton polygon. Uh, and the Newton polygon is like the usual T attic Newton polygon of this power series L of S, which is a power series in S, whose coefficients uh, live in you know, K round round T, right? That's a discretely valued field. So I'm gonna take the evaluation coming from T I'm gonna make my Newton polygons that way. Um, so uh, previous work of James Upton and Joe Cameron Miller uh, using uh, this, this item three from, from, from above shows that in fact, the Newton polygon is always on or above the Hodge polygon. And these two touch periodically. Uh, so they sort of share vertices uh, every so often. That, as I understand their work, that critically uses that the base is the affine line. Uh, somehow that's, that's very, very important because that makes this, this L function something that you can actually get your hands on and compute and do things with. Um, okay, but like once you know that the Newton polygon and Hodge polygon are pretty close together, Anything you can say about the Newton polygon will tell you something about the Hodge polygon, which is what you ultimately want to know about. Uh, and so the final step is to explicitly compute 
what the Newton polygon is uh, using, again, that the base is the affine line uh, and that that's pretty explicit. Um, so that's, those are the kind of main steps of the proof. Of course, there's lots of details in, in all of them and you know, happy to say more if people like, but I thought I'd end with some future directions. So uh, first is that, right, this, this was all about just differentials. Ultimately, of course, I'd like to think about Durham cohomology. Um, you know, not just wave these extensions under the rug, but really think about the p-torsion. Uh, you can, of course, think about the p-primary component or the full p-divisible group of the Jacobian, and that would be like studying the crystalline cohomology. That's going to be much harder because you know now it's equicharacteristic and all of your magic of characteristic P, it's still there, but uh, somehow it's it's much more subtle and less powerful. Um, we'd like to prove this conjecture that we made in general, not just for this kind of special class of towers. Uh, we'd like to weaken the monodromy stable hypothesis. Um, and, you know, ultimately, Right, ZP is just one of many possible Piatic Lie groups. So ultimately, you'd like to study maybe non-abelian towers and do some U.S. Sauer theory for them too. So uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for listening to this story. It's really um, a favorite story of mine. So uh, happy to talk about it more at any point. Wonderful. Let's see. Are there any questions? Maybe I could start with one. Um, so this monodromy stable hypothesis, I don't know if you're familiar with the work of um, like Obis and Vavers and Pop where they lifted cyclic covers from characteristic P to characteristic zero. And they could do that under certain conditions on the ramification filtration. And I wondered whether your monodromy stable hypothesis might be related to those conditions at all. Ah, that's a really cool question. Um, so I don't know the answer to that. I, I, I think I have one example. Um, so there's this Degusa tower in characteristic P. That's monodromy stable. And my, my experience of like how you lift that tower with the group action to, to characteristic, to mixed characteristic is with these kind of cat's maser models of modular curves like these agusa curves sort of show up um as special fibers in various ways uh in these models of modular curves and to get kind of nice models you usually need lots and lots and lots of roots of unity uh mm -hmm. and so i guess just based on that kind of limited experience i kind of guess that already for the mono, monodromy stability, uh, there are examples of ZP towers and characteristic P where to lift sort of up to level N uh, back to mixed characteristic, you need like, you know, P to the nth roots of unity, which is a lot of ramification. Um, but mm -hmm. yeah, I, I, that's a really good question. Um, Yeah, let's see, any other questions here? Oh, I think uh, David Rowe has his hand raised. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, so I was kind of thinking about the opposite direction of these like extremely fast growth of, uh, of genus. Um, is there any way to bound it like by some sort of computability criteria? Like, can you say that like, I mean, arbitrarily fast is very large. Like thinking about this from a computer. Right. So is it really arbitrarily fast or like, or is it just? I mean, I guess the limit. I guess, so maybe this isn't answering your question because I think you're, you're asking a very interesting question. Uh, but like, yeah, maybe I can write write something kind of briefly. Um, ooh, lots of secret notes. Okay. Uh, 
let's put a new page here. I mean, um, okay, so if you wanna like class field theory, ooh, green, uh, hopefully you can see this. So class field theory will tell you uh, that like, um, you know, a, a ZP tower of P1, let's say over FP uh, branched only over infinity. I mean, this these are gonna be given by, uh, I don't know why I wrote if and only if, but these are gonna be given by rho from um, the one units uh, mm -hmm. in FP uh, surjecting onto ZP or something like that. Mm -hmm. And I mean, um, you know, this, this guy is topologically generated by things like one plus T to the D where um, P doesn't divide D and so it's free on those generators. Mm -hmm. And I, I think, you know, when you write down your row, I think you can sort of really take one plus T to the D sort of more or less wherever you please, just uh -huh. to anything. Uh, yeah. And so I think that's right. I mean, you have to worry about continuity, yeah. Um, so maybe there's some condition, but it's incredibly mild. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't, that probably doesn't answer your question though. Um, you, you, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I guess maybe it depends on like what you mean by having a, a tower, right? So if you're parameterizing in this way and you allow your integers, the, the Ds to grow however fast you like, then... Um, Yeah, I'm just I'm just always surprised when like when you have like something that naturally arising that you can like make like literally arbitrarily fast growing, right? Like faster yeah, than I mean, you could, beautiful function. Like, right? like, yeah, whatever whatever you want. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I'd say I was sort of terrifying. I, I don't know. I've I have nightmares about this kind of thing sometimes. <laughs> this may be a related question by Maria in the chat. Maria, do you want to ask that or uh, do you want me to? Oh, sorry, I can't really talk, but you could ask it. No, you go ahead. You go ahead. Okay, I'll, I'll ask it. Um, so uh, why did this is Maria Fox's question? Why did you choose to study basic towers? Ah, oh, that's a really good question. So yeah, I mean these. I think. So these definitely occur in prior work. So they occur in work of um, Davis, Wan, and Shao. So they study these towers as well. And uh, they're interested in L functions. Uh, and they prove some really beautiful results about um, like what these L functions look like, like, uh, like the numerator of the zeta function of... Uh, you know, curves in a basic tower, what's the structure of those things uh, as you sort of go, go into the limit? And you can rephrase this, um, like you can rephrase what they're doing uh, via Dudenne theory. And what they're doing is, well, um, you look at your basic tower of curves uh, for each one, you take the full P divisible group, uh, of the Jacobian. So that's like looking at the P primary class group scheme, if you like, and um, take its Dudenne module. Uh, so that's some really interesting thing in mixed characteristic. And then you invert P. And so when you do that, you get what's called an F isocrystal. And you can interpret their results as saying that as you go up the tower, the uh, slopes of these F isocrystals, which by the Dudenne-Manin classification of isocrystals determines them up to isogeny, uh, those slopes behave in a completely regular uh, and predictable way. Um, so yeah, the paper is, is by Davis, Wan, and Shao. It's a very beautiful paper. And that's, that's where we learned about these kind of basic uh, ZP towers, though. Uh, that's, that's what um, I think basic 
maybe we coined that term. I don't know for what it's worth. It's probably a terrible term, so I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, I that's part of the reason that that I wanted to sort of talk about p torsion because um, you know s slopes of like regularity of isogeny type uh, as you go up some tower is a wonderful kind of Iwasawa theory, but it doesn't have a whole lot to say about torsion, right? Because like when you invert P, you, you suddenly like lost almost everything you knew about modulo P, <laughs> unfortunately. So I think uh, uh, I'm much more interested in kind of like torsion phenomena uh, rather than isogeny, though I think, I think both are very um, interesting and, and pretty directions to pursue. Uh, yeah, good question. 